Discover Geography, Lesson 3-4, Cultural Landscapes. We've been talking about some of the physical processes and natural processes that structure our landscape. And in this lesson, we want to turn to talking about how landscapes have a cultural dimension. So what you see in this picture is a cultural landscape. We can obviously see the imprint of human culture on this particular landscape. People have cleared some of the forest and they've built this house. They've built it in a particular style. They've built it for a particular purpose. It has connections to other cultural activities that are going on within the society that created this particular landscape. This, however, is also a cultural landscape. You can't see any obvious physical signs of human presence in this particular picture. This is a naturally formed rock formation. We've got a natural ecosystem growing around it. However, this particular landscape, which is known as Uluru, or Ayers Rock, in the center of Australia, has a great deal of cultural significance to it. To the local Aboriginal people, it's a central component of their mythology. They have stories that explain how the rock came to be that help them to understand their place in the world. It's a location for a lot of important cultural activities, rituals, and so forth. For white Australians, it's a symbol of their country. It's the heart of their nation. And so all of that cultural significance that's placed on this particular landscape makes this a cultural landscape as well. So understand cultural landscapes, we first have to understand what culture is. When we think about culture, we often think about things like you see in the picture here. This is a Turkish street festival in an American city. People doing things that commemorate their heritage, for example. But attending a college class is also culture. This is also a cultural activity to come to class on a certain schedule to sit and learn in a particular format. We can define culture as consisting of shared patterns of meaning and behavior. So when we talk about culture, we're interested in things that are shared, things that are common to a group of people, not individual idiosyncrasies. We're interested in patterns. We're interested in things that happen the same way or the similar way again and again. And we're interested in both behavior, the physical things that people do, and the meanings that they give to that behavior. So if we look at something like a baseball game, this is shared because we have lots of people that understand the rules of baseball and that are cooperating to do this game together even as they're competing against each other within the rules of the game. It's a pattern. The rules of baseball are consistent from game to game. And it's about both behavior, so the guy in the picture has swung that bat around, that's a behavior, and about meaning. So the meaning of what he's doing is hitting a home run. S culture is made up of agency and structure. So agency is the ability of people to make choices and exercise free will. You can decide what you're doing. So in the baseball example, it's your ability to decide how to swing that bat how to run when you go around the bases, where to throw that ball to if you catch it. And then there's structure, which are rules and habits that shape what we do. So in the case of baseball, there are explicit rules that you're not allowed to, you know, get closer to the pitcher's mound than standing by home plate, that if somebody tags you with the ball, you're out. And there are implicit habits. There are conventions and customs about how the game is played that people are going to follow. And so structure is going to shape agency. Structure is going to tell you what are the options available to you. And so structure will both constrain you. It will rule certain things out. It'll say you can't do this or that. It's against the rules. It goes against the habits you formed. But will also create opportunities. It will create new things that you can do now that wouldn't have been available to you before. If it weren't for the rules of the baseball game, you wouldn't be able to hit a home run. There would be no meaning to that. There'd be no one there to throw the ball to you. Agency then reproduces structure. The structures can't exist on their own. They're not real entities. What they are is 
patterns in how people exercise their agency. So the structure of a social system will channel people into exercising their agency in a certain way. It'll make it reasonable and rational and obvious and advantageous for you to act in a certain way by making certain options easy, by penalizing you for taking other options. And then when you act in accordance with that structure, you reproduce it. You make that structure live on to influence yourself and others later. So agency and structure are mutually reinforcing. A landscape can be a form of structure. Both the physical construction of that landscape and the meanings that are embedded in it can act as a form of structure, can act to both constrain and enable our exercise of agency. So as an example, what you see in the photo there is the Worcester Common Outlets, which was a giant outlet mall that was built in the center of the city of Worcester, Massachusetts. You can see in the map below, the red area is the outlet mall, and it's right in the middle of downtown Worcester. A number of important streets that ran through that part of the city were eliminated to create this outlet mall. And so initially, the hope was that this was going to be something that was going to be a big economic boon for the city. It was going to bring commerce in, et cetera. But it was built just as suburban strip malls were beginning to explode. And those suburban strip malls had a lot more area and were a lot better location for a lot of stores. And so the Worcester Common Outlets went into decline. The stores in it closed down, and the city was left with this giant empty husk of a mall right in the middle of downtown. And so this became a constraint on the lives of people in Worcester, both in a physical sense. We had this big thing blocking traffic in the middle of the city, but then also in the sense of the meanings that were attached to this. This became a symbol of the city's failure. It became a symbol of the inability of Worcester to get ahead, to become a successful, prosperous city. And so because of that, the meaning that it carried, the symbolism that it had for the city, tended to drag the city down until very recently it's now being uh, leveled and this area is being rebuilt in a way that will hopefully be both physically more conducive to the kind of life that the city wants and will eliminate that symbol of the city's failure. So to wrap up this lesson we want to talk about symbolic landscapes. So I've mentioned the symbolism of the Worcester Common Outlets, that it represented the city's failure to develop. Some symbolic landscapes are constructed in order to deliberately portray a particular message. So a symbolic landscape is a landscape that conveys some sort of meaning to people who see it, to who interact with it. So here you see Mount Rushmore. It's a famous symbolic landscape that was deliberately constructed to convey a certain message. It was meant to convey a message about the greatness of the United States, about the greatness of these particular four presidents who were chosen to be part of it, it was meant to convey the ideals of the American nation, and it was meant to convey the expansion of America into the West because it's located on a mountainside in South Dakota. And so most people who would go to Mount Rushmore would see these faces carved in the stone, and they would take on those particular meanings. They would read that landscape as conveying those particular ideas to them, and in fact, that's why most people go to Mount Rushmore. They want to experience the patriotic grandeur of these four big carvings. But even when a landscape is intended to convey a very specific message, not everybody is going to take that same message from it. In the case of Mount Rushmore, the local Native American people, the Lakota, took a very different message from Mount Rushmore. What they see is something that had been a sacred mount to, mountain to them that now has the faces of four old white guys carved into it. So to them, it symbolizes their defeat and it symbolizes the loss of control of their land through the expansion of a white-dominated American society. So it's a very negative symbolic significance that Mount Rushmore has for most of the Lakota people. And so in response to this, 
some people within the tribe have begun to create their own symbolic landscape in another mountain nearby. So that mountain is currently in the process of being carved into the likeness of Crazy Horse, who's a famous Lakota war leader and who led the defeat of General Custer at um, one of the most famous victories for Native Americans during the Indian Wars. And so here you see in the foreground a uh, scale model of what this sculpture will look like in the end, and then you can see in the background where it's begun to be carved into the mountain. So the intent of this sculpture is to represent sort of a Native American pride, that our sculpture is bigger and more dramatic and more powerful than the sculpture of those four white presidents. And so therefore, you can't ignore the fact that this is Lakota land, that the Native Americans were here first, and that this is sort of their land. And that's the intended meaning of this particular sculpture. But this sculpture is controversial within the Lakota community because not everybody thinks that carving a crazy horse into the side of a mountain is the right way to treat this mountain because we're again taking this mountain and carving it up and we're honoring just one particular individual and that idea of picking out specific individuals and elevating them as heroes and icons is something that is very common within white american culture we all recognize those four presidents because we see their faces all over the place, but it's not something that's as important in traditional Native American culture. And Crazy Horse in particular never allowed photographs of himself to be taken and asked to be buried in an unmarked location so that nobody would know where he was because he didn't want to become this kind of hero long after his death where people focus on him as an individual. So. We've got a, a complicated set of different meanings and different significances attached to these various sculptures by various people within the communities that live around them. A landscape can have symbolic significance even when it wasn't deliberately created as a symbolic landscape. Even when it wasn't structured in order to convey some sort of a meaning, it can still convey a meaning. We can attribute meaning to it. So in this case, the picture you see here was one of the first results that came up when I did a search for the phrase amber waves of grain. So this is a very well-known phrase and it refers to this particular type of landscape where we see the kind of rustic farm. We have this idea of a you know, small town, heartland values, people who work hard and care about their community. All that can be conveyed through this image of this particular landscape. And you might see a landscape like this in an advertisement, for example, if the advertiser wants you to associate their product with those kind of values. So this landscape has taken on these symbolic meanings, even though that wasn't the reason for building this landscape the way uh, that it is. <laughs> 